Good morning, everyone. I'm Jean Farrington, and I'll be reading this morning from Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Thanks, Gene. Well, we're continuing our series that we're calling uh, Questions Jesus Asked. And the idea is that one of the primary ways that Jesus taught that he interacted with people was by asking questions, asking questions of them. And, and we, we talked about that. One of the, the great things about this is this allows Jesus to get to the heart of the matter. What is most important to, to lead the conversation in a direction by asking questions to, to help people get to a place of most importance. And uh, in addition to that, questions allow for introspection for the original audience, for us as well, to look at our lives and, and to see, does my life line up with this teaching that Jesus has for me? But beyond just that, questions are such a great way to draw someone in. And that's what Jesus does. Rather than just showing up and just dumping a bunch of content on people, he asks a question, which allows for people to, to draw near to him in his teaching. Now, the question today is not a question that draws the disciples in. In fact, it does the opposite. Uh, they are walking along the way, and the disciples are arguing with each other to see which of them is the greatest. And Jesus asked them this question, what were you discussing on the way? Or if we could just put that a different way, what are you talking about? And this question causes them to absolutely shut down, to retreat. Their conversation ends, and rather than drawing in, they go completely silent. I think about it like a situation that could play out with, with parents and their kids. So you hear the, the sound of smashing, which sounds awfully like the breaking of one of the cups in the kitchen. And, and so you call out, what was that? Or what are you doing? Only for there to be a, a slight pause and then the response is, nothing. You know what happened. Your child knows that you know what happens. But in asking this question, rather than, than uh, admitting it or confessing, it's this retreat away because they know what they did was wrong. And that's what's going on with the disciples here. Now, I, I do want to be clear that the disciples are wrong. They are arguing about which one of them is the greatest. But what they are wrong about is not a desire to be great. And you see that even in Jesus' instruction for them, it's not, don't ever try to be great. It's, if you want to be great, here's how you do it. He redirects what greatness looks like. See, I think a desire to be great, to succeed, to do well, is something that's good and put within us. If nothing else, we have a God who is called great. And all that he created, he did, he did, and he said it was good. So this pursuit of excellence that we have is something that I think is good and innate within us. Greatness is a good thing, but it becomes a very dangerous idol. See, what I think the, the disciples are getting wrong here and what so many of us could get wrong as well is in how we answer the question, what is greatness? What is it that we consider to be greatness? If, if we were to talk, we, we could list people that we would say are, are great in our society. Uh, what would be the reasons why we say that they're great? What is it that's, that's shared within them that we would say, this is what makes this person great? It could be the amount of wealth that someone has or the authority that they have, the position that they're in, how, how many followers they have, the impact that they make on their community. Someone has beauty, or uh, they're, they're a household name. They have this entire list of accomplishments. We, we say that someone has one or a few of those, we would say that person is great. But I think our idea of greatness, what we might say makes a person great in our society, reveals a couple things about us. One, more often than not, we mostly want the things that come with greatness. 
We say this person is great because they have so much money. And you know what? I would like to have that much money. This person is great because they're beautiful. And I wish I was beautiful like that. I, I wish I had that aspect to it. But more to the point, when we think of greatness, it's often in terms, it's often in comparative terms. See, for us sitting in here, I, I don't know that we are overcome with the desire to be seen as the greatest. You know, to be known internationally, to have so many followers, to, to be considered the greatest. We might not struggle with that temptation. But I do need to be better than you. I do need to be greater than you. And so often as we talk about greatness, it comes down to uh, what can I get and how can I demonstrate I'm better than others? And that's what the disciples are going through here. How can I show that I'm better than you? And how do I get what, is, uh, what comes with being better than you? That's what they're arguing ab uh, about at this time. And while greatness and comparing ourselves to others is very much so a part of, of what we go through in, in our lives, there still is an aspect where we read this passage and, and it sounds a little weird. Like, who actually has an argument about these things? Like, like to see them having this type of argument, like, like we, we compare and we think we're better than others, but that's something I do in my head or behind your back. I have class. So like to actually see it played out in front of each other, that's weird for us. But this is where I think we're missing a cultural difference between uh, our culture and the, the culture that they had in the first century here. So, so the disciples would have been part of an honor-shame culture, and plenty of those still exist to this day. So the idea is that, that what you do and who you are brings about honor, and if you do what's negative in, in society, you bring about shame, and, and who you can interact with, what you're able to do, is based off of the unwritten ledger of how much honor versus how much shame you have. And so at this point, to, to, to show uh, that you were better than someone, to, that you had more honor than someone else, uh, it's not enough to say that you are better than them. You needed the receipts to back it up. You needed to show them why you were greater, why you had more honor, why you were better than someone else. And so that's why they're having this argument here. But even though there's this cultural difference, I still think that the teaching that Jesus has of showing what greatness looks like has tremendous impact for those of us here in, in, a, in a culture where self-sacrifice, not insisting on what's due to you, humility, not comparing yourself to others is something that's foreign to us. We read this passage and it comes in a series of fumblings, of mistakes that the disciples have been making uh, throughout the Gospel of Mark, but, but especially in this particular section. Uh, in chapter eight, uh, sorry, at the beginning of chapter nine, uh, we have a moment that's called the transfiguration, where some of the disciples get to see Jesus in his glory. It's incredible. It's the clearest picture so far that Jesus is God and the disciples don't understand it. Even to the point where Peter speaks up, he, he wants to do something and he completely misses the point of the whole thing. He makes a massive mistake there. And then they come down the mountain and the rest of the disciples are there and they're arguing because they weren't able to do a miracle. They're misrepresenting Jesus in this time, instead fighting amongst each other. And then we get this incredible moment. Jesus pulls his disciples aside. He, he gives them this really clear teaching. The second time that he said, I'm going to the cross, I'm gonna die, but I'm gonna be raised again. Incredible teaching that he's given them in advance. And it says, and none of the disciples said anything. They don't get it. They don't understand. They, they can't process what Jesus is telling them. But when they do open their mouth, the very next opportunity that they have to speak in the Gospel of Mark, what's well, the passage that was just read for us? It's them arguing with each other about who is the greatest. Jesus says, I'm gonna die and be raised again. Well, we can't say anything, we, we don't understand. But now we're gonna open up our mouths to say that we're better than, that I'm better than you. They're completely missing the teaching that Jesus is showing them, of him teaching them why it is that he's great. But all that they see, all they see is this movement that continues to look great in their eyes, that continues to look spectacular. Because everywhere they go, they see that Jesus brings about greatness. Uh, in the Gospel of Mark, this is what uh, has happened so far. In, in Mark 1.8, it says, His, Jesus, fame spread everywhere. 
Chapter 2, verse 12, they were all amazed. 520, everyone marveled. 542, onlookers were immediately overcome with amazement. 651, the disciples were utterly astounded. 737, the crowds were astonished beyond measure. Everywhere the disciples go, they see Jesus as the picture of greatness. But they miss his teaching as to what it is that makes him great. All they see are the crowds. All they see is what's going that's so successful. And they're fighting with each other to say, how do I get my part of it? And this has created a a time where the disciples are constantly bickering, constantly arguing with each other. They argued back in chapter eight about which of them forgot to bring the bread. They argued uh, in chapter nine uh, with opponents, people who are outsiders, because it it looks like they're losing face with them. We we don't want to have shame here. They argued uh, just after our passage about uh, people who are successfully doing exorcisms in Jesus' name, but they're not part of our group. They can't get this honor that's due to them. This is ours. They'll, uh, They'll snort about a woman being extravagant to the point of wastefulness to show honor to Jesus in chapter 14. Later in chapter 14, Jesus will declare, or sorry, Peter will declare that he will outdo all the rest of the disciples in being faithful to Jesus only to deny him a few verses after that. All along the way, Jesus is showing them what true greatness is. It's more than the crowds. It's more than what's successful. It's more than how you can get your part of it. He's showing them what true greatness actually is. And so you almost get this comedic picture of the disciples continuing to mess up, continuing to not see Jesus, And so we look at this passage about uh, Jesus redefining what greatness is, and we say, yeah, this is going to be really good teaching for them. But we talked last week about hypocrisy, how it's easy for us to see the faults of others and miss the clear faults uh, faults that are in ourselves. And, And it's really easy here for us to see where the disciples are falling short, their mistakes, how they need this teaching. And maybe we miss the fact that we need the same teaching. And certainly not all of us. Some of us know that aspect within us to compare ourselves to others, to want to elevate ourselves, even if it comes at the expense of others. We, we know that that's a trait of ours. And so we just read this passage and it's convicting. I am unnecessary today. Please don't ever tell me that. But, but if, if you could just read this passage and see this is speaking in my life, then, then, then we can see very clearly what our faults are. But, but I think for most of us, we might not be as aware of how tempted we are to compare, how tempted we are to exalt ourselves, the pursuit of greatness as we define it. Because I I think that has a a subtle way of sneaking into just about every part of our life. One uh, small example of it, we talked about judgment last week, about how we're, we're constantly making assessments of others, which could be critiques or condemnations about what someone else is doing wrong. And we said, we, we don't want to overlook the wrong that's in our life as we are looking at the wrong that's in others. But the other side of that is as we are pointing out the wrong in others, it almost always comes as we are saying, but I've got this part right. I am doing well here. Just in the small act, we see an aspect of comparison. And I think it sneaks into our life in just about every area as we see other people. As, as we go about our life, as we're at work, we see other people. We're making comparisons. I mean, this, this could be we see how someone else parents their child. Oh, well, I, I never would have done that. Or we're in class and, and uh, a, another student asks a clarifying question. Wait, they needed, they needed to clarify that thing? That was so easy. Or we're driving home and, and uh, so how dr- someone is driving in front of us. What, did they just get their license? Or the decisions that our sibling makes. You know, I love them, but... Or, or we can give all of these other examples of how comparison seeps its way into our lives of these assessments where we elevate ourselves often at the expense of others, where we get to come off in, in the scenarios that we play out in our head as the greatest. It's easy for us to see the failures of the disciples in this passage. And yet I don't want us to overlook the fact that that we have that same need as well. That same fight over what does greatness look like 
that takes place in our lives. And yet look at the picture of Jesus in this moment. There's no condemnation. There's no shame that he piles on the disciples. There's no, I just told you that I'm gonna die and you guys are fighting of which one of you thinks you're the greatest after mistake, after mistake, after mistake. None of that whatsoever. Instead, he sits down. He takes the posture of a a teacher and he takes this moment of another one of their failures to teach them what is true and right. Do you see the picture of love and care and tenderness of Jesus in this moment? To teach his followers, to teach us as well. And he begins this teaching by giving a a new picture of greatness. We talked before about, uh, it, it all boils down to how we answer to that question is, what is greatness? Well, Jesus gives to us a way to answer that question, a new picture of what greatness is. And this starts in uh, verse 35. It says, and he, Jesus, sat down and called the 12, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. It, Jesus says that, that if anyone is seeking to be first, you must be last of all. It's the, this complete overhaul of what greatness looks like. So rather than elevating ourselves, rather than pushing down others so that we can reach higher, rather than seeing ourselves as being greater than anyone else, he says, to be great, you must become last of all. Hey, and again, right here, it's not saying that there's anything wrong with being, with being first, with being great. He says, if anyone would be first, What he changes is how that happens. He must be last of all and servant of all. And so uh, what Jesus gives to us first about what this new picture of greatness looks like is he says it looks like lowness. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all. He must make himself lower. Rather than elevating ourselves above, above others, we seek to make ourselves lower than others for their sakes. And this is what he gets to with an object lesson in verse 36. And he took a child and put him in the, the midst of them, in the midst of the disciples, and taking him up in his arms, he said to them, uh, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. We have another aspect where our, our culture is different than the culture of the time. Uh, we tend to view kids as, as innocent and, and vulnerable. And, and uh, even this picture, especially of young kids, uh, this, this image of purity. And that would have been different for the first century. Absolutely, kids were loved and adored and seen as a massive blessing. But for them, the value of a child was in their potential rather than merely being a child the identity of being a child. See, again, as we talk about this being an honor and shame culture, kids have no honor that they have earned for themselves. They have no status in the culture. They are entirely dependent on other people, not just for their needs, but for their place in society. And so this idea of, of receiving a child, of, of uh, looking to do good for a child is, is unheard of there. Because what do you get back? They can't pay you. They can't owe you a favor. They, they can't, you can't get some sort of honor for helping them because they are entirely honorless. And even this image of Jesus taking the child into his arms is radically subverting the culture at this time. I, I'm, I'm gonna say something very dated. Uh, this was the culture at the time. Uh, at, at this time, to be with kids was considered women's work. Unless if you had money, then it's even lower than that. It became servant's work. And so this idea of of a man holding a child would have been radically different. For us, we we read this passage and it's it's adorable. Like, look at how cute this is. Jesus holds this child into his arms. It's it's wonderful. But they would have seen this as, "This this, this can't be. This is so undignified. He's supposed to be some leader and he's interacting with kids this way. This is what Jesus is showing us with this object lesson, that we are to be last of all, seeking to care for even those who are the lowest of society, and we see him actually do this by giving dignity and value to someone who had no dignity or value, to care, not just in words, but to demonstrate his care for those who are last, who are least. And it brings up a question for us. Uh, who, who is this in our culture? 
Who would be the last or the least in our culture? Someone who cannot offer anything in return, who has no status or claim or, or worth. They can't owe us favors. There's someone who's vulnerable. They're overlooked. Who, who is it that it would be undignified for us to help them? Because the teaching of Jesus here is that we are called to elevate them and lower ourselves. Who, who is it that fits that category for us? I mean, this might be hanging out with the kid at school that you are gonna lose face with other people just by being seen with them. But not just being seen with them, going beyond that. That as they're being ridiculed, as they're being put down, as they are ascribed as being worthless, like that is the time that we step in that we lower ourselves to be the brunt of that for that person's sake. Or those in our culture who are overlooked, that we might be tempted to say that they are a drain on our society. What we do instead is we pour ourselves out in order to elevate them. Or the person who's eight rungs below you on the org chart, that we treat them better than we would our boss's boss or someone who's in a capacity where they are serving us, at a restaurant, coffee shop, someone's fixing their cars, whatever it might be where, where we might be tempted to, you work for me in that time, to instead seek opportunities that we can be a servant for them. Because that gets to the other part of this new picture of greatness that Jesus is giving us, that we lower ourselves, but we do so in service of this person. That he says, whoever receives one like this, this one who has no status, who can offer nothing in return, whoever receives one like this, receives me. And the idea behind this isn't just going up to them and say, hey, I receive you. Like it's so much more than that. This is an active care and concern for this other person. But it's not just thinking good things about them. To receive someone is to actively work to do good on their behalf. And so what this is telling us is that to receive the least of them, to receive who is last, isn't something that we get to a point to where we say, you know what, I accomplished this. I check the box. Hey, I'm good for today because I received someone yesterday. No, this is a mindset, a continual mindset of looking for opportunities to elevate others and lower ourselves, looking for opportunities to serve and do good for someone, even if it comes at our expense. It is an ongoing posture, not to be seen as greater than other people, but to be the servant of all. And the reason for that is that Jesus has done exactly this on our, on our part, uh, chapters 9 and 10 have this whole teaching on what does it look like to be great? What does it look like to serve other people? It, it's been going on all throughout the section from Jesus showing his glory and yet he's going to die. Of him telling his disciples uh, what it looks to be great. But again in chapter 10, they're going to argue more about which one of them is the greatest. Uh, arguing against people on the outside versus others. To have this posture like a child and receive those like a child. All throughout these two chapters, is pointing to this idea of what does it look like to be great and it culminates in what is probably the fam most famous verse in the Gospel of Mark, which gives us a summary of what this looks like. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man, the name Jesus used more than anything else for himself, for even Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This idea of serving other people actively, ongoing, looking to uh, lower ourselves and elevate them, looking to do good on the account of other people is what Jesus himself has done for us. This completely changes this idea of what greatness looks like. It, so often, greatness is this individualistic idea that it is me separating myself from the pack. That as I demonstrate how, how good I am, how much better I am, you get to see how wonderful I am, that there is no one like me. That's this idea of greatness that removes me from other people. Jesus instead says, no, greatness is joining in with other people. Greatness is you joining to serve and elevate those who might otherwise be overlooked. Because what happens? Those who receive one like this receives me. Jesus joins in with us receives not just me, but the one who sent me. We join in with the Father this way. This whole idea is pointing to the idea that greatness comes in collaboration 
but rather than competition. As we lower ourselves, as we seek to do good, to serve others as we have been served. How does this actually play out? I, I, I mean, we're talking about all these things, and it sounds great, it's, it's cool that it's, it's so different, it's, it's radical, but, but how does this actually show up in my life? How do we take this posture of greatness that Jesus is calling us to do? Well, like so much of Jesus' teaching, it's, it's countercultural. It, it runs different than how we would act apart from hearing of Jesus in a sinful world. This idea of lowering ourselves to be made great, that, that sounds so counterintuitive. It's backwards. So the start of all of this, as we read in Romans 12, as we read in uh, Ephesians 4, the start of all of this is a, a renewing of our minds, of a changing of what our mindset is, that we change what our, our idea of greatness is. That as we go to work tomorrow, as we go to school, as we drive in our neighborhood, we go to the grocery store, we do so with the understanding that I'm not looking to elevate myself, but I'm looking to serve those who are around me. The, the idea is that we need to change our mindset to what our understanding of greatness is. John Chrysostom, he's, he's one of the early church fathers. He, he talks about a little bit of what changing this mindset looks like. And he did this in a sermon that he gave to the Roman imperial court. So the most powerful and greatest people in his day. And this is what he said to them and, and what I think is helpful for us. He said, if you are in love with precedence and the highest honor, again, he's saying this to an honor shame society, if you are in love with precedence and the highest honor, pursue the things in last place. Pursue being the least valued of all. Pursue being the lowliest of all. Pursue being the smallest of all. Pursue placing yourself behind others. It's that idea that if we love that idea of greatness where we get to separate, where people see that I'm better, that I get to prove to you that I'm better than you, as we compare ourselves to other people, Chrysostom helps us see if that's what our mindset is. We need to work instead to pursue being last of all. And I think that there is a way that we can grow in this. There's a way that we can practice. If, if this doesn't readily come to us, if, if we uh, aren't, don't easily see opportunities that we can elevate others and lower ourselves, the way that we practice this is by serving by looking for opportunities that we can come alongside and help people because serving is an act of lowering ourselves for the betterment of someone else. It is practicing what this mindset entails. So it's looking for opportunities inside the church or out that we can serve other people to grow in this mindset, to be more ready that as we leave those serving opportunities, to see all of life through this lens of serving, not elevating myself, but elevating you. That serving is a way that we practice this mindset so that it could become more natural to us. I, I really like uh, the curriculum that we use for kids' ministry. It, it captures what this looks like really well. It, ha it has an emphasis on serving, especially getting families to serve with each other. And they identify serving as, as just this readiness and willingness to ask the question, what needs to be done? What needs to be done? And so wherever you are, wherever God has you, what needs to be done so that we can grow in this idea of, of having this new mindset of greatness, so that we can put into practice serving, so that we can lower ourselves as Jesus is calling to here. But the second way that this works out in our lives is I don't want to overlook the, the fact that Jesus uses a child in this illustration, this one who's so vulnerable, who has no status, who, who can't repay, that, that is uh, overlooked in society. That is the example of what it looks like to lower ourselves to elevate other people. And we ask the question of who does that look like in our society? But it goes beyond that. It's asking that question, what needs to be done? And so how do we receive the least? How do we receive those who would be last in our society? How do we care for and encourage and support and value and identify dignity to build up those whom we might otherwise put down? How do we do this unheralded work of the kingdom of God? For some of us, this will take new opportunities to leave what we normally do to seek out those who are least, those who are last. 
This is what we see our, our uh, global partners, the missionaries who leave the United States or go to other parts of the United States to seek out the least, to be with them, to do exactly what Jesus calls us to do, to lower ourselves, to serve those who would otherwise be overlooked. And plenty of others stay within their cities and, and look for opportunities and sometimes find problems that they didn't even know existed and yet ask the question, what needs to be done? And are working to be part of a solution. So it might come with looking for new opportunities. And if you are looking for a place, what what does it look like here in Thornton, in the surrounding areas, to serve those who are least, those who are last? Well, let me tell you, Brody has a whole list of opportunities. If you don't know Brody Young, he works with our our students, but he also does local outreach here at, at this campus. And so often he is going to different places to to serve and care for people in our city. And more often than not, he's going by himself. And that's not always true, but but there's so many opportunities to to serve with him or at places to care for people in this city, to care for those who might be overlooked otherwise. If you are looking for new opportunities, let me tell you, Brody has a dozen or so. Seek him out afterwards. But more often than not, I don't think we actually need new opportunities. That to find those who are least, we often don't see them, not because they're not there, we just overlook them. More often than not, it's not about adding something onto our life, but where God has you right now, there are places to lower ourselves so that we can lift up others. I promise you, there are people suffering in your neighborhood. Do you know who they are? I guarantee you there are people vulnerable that you come across as you go to work, as you go to school, as, that you will drive past. And it's seeking to just ask in that situation what needs to be done. And, and more often than not, we don't need some special training to be a help. We don't need to have tremendous resources in order to be an assistance to them. Because the, the, the way that God tends to work through his people is through what God has worked through them in the past. That as we meet people who, who, who are suffering, that, that, that we are looking to elevate them, that we are looking to care for them and be a support to them, more often than not, it's the experiences that we have that are the greatest benefit to this person. All it takes is a willingness to actually do what Jesus is calling for us to do. And this idea is captured in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, no, as I'm reading it, as we're reading it together, see, see if you notice any repeated words. It, it'll be a little bit subtle, so it'll take a bit of your focus to see what is, the, what is uh, the focus of this passage. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. For what purpose? What's the reason for that? so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. The comfort we've received helps people going through anything that they're going through. With the comfort that we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. I don't know if you picked up on any repeated words there, but uh, that's what this passage is, is driving at. As we're in Mark chapter 9, we, we see this argument that's taking place between the disciples. And yet the immediate context for that is Jesus saying, I'm going to the cross, I'm dying, and I'm raising again. This whole discussion on what does it look like to be the greatest, how do we lower ourselves, how do we serve other people, comes in the context of Jesus pointing us to the greatest act of service there ever was or ever will be. Jesus dying for us. Him taking this death as ours. So we serve others because we have been so served by Jesus. We love others because we have been so loved by Jesus. We bless and forgive others because we have been so blessed and forgiven by Jesus. We lower ourselves because we see what Jesus did to lower himself on our account. See, true greatness, it's not in our relation to others. I am better than you. Look at me up here. I'm so much greater True greatness comes from our relation to Christ. The one who receives this person receives me. 
I wonder what it would look like. As, as we look at Jesus' simple question to this, the squabbling of his disciples, to point them to what true greatness looks like. I wonder what, what it would look like for us in those moments that we are comparing ourselves to other people, that we're looking for ways to elevate ourselves, that, that we're quite proud of the way that we've demonstrated us to be great. I wonder what it would look like in the, that moment to just hear his voice asking the simple question, what are you talking about? Not to shame, not to bring condemnation, but just in this really simple question, to help us to see that we don't want to settle for what is a lesser form of greatness.